guest is the co-headliner for UFC 235, the biggest card of the year already, and he's going to be fighting for the light heavyweight title. Lionheart makes his return to the show. Anthony Smith. Hi, Anthony. How are you? I'm good, Luke. How are you? Anthony, how is it that you're a fighter who trains every day? I'm a lowly media loser, and I look like death, and you look fresh as a daisy. Look at you, ready to go. <laughs> yeah, fresh off a plane uh, back here in Denver and uh, going to finish up this last this last hard week of camp. Okay, so you went home for the weekend? What do, what do you mean? I go home every weekend. Do you really? Wow. Do you fly? Do you drive? How do you get there? Yeah, I fly. I fly. I leave Friday night after sparring, and then I'm back uh, back Monday. And so you're trying to do the dad and the husband thing or something, right? Yeah, yeah, man. I, I love it out here in Denver, but uh, I, I don't think that I'd be able to stay out here for a full eight or nine weeks or whatever it is without without seeing my family. I'm kind of a sissy when it comes to that. So I do. I, I travel back and forth every weekend. But what is the trade-off there? On the one hand, the positives are obvious, right? You get to be with your family, you get to see your kids, so that's a no-brainer. How much of it? Uh, how much of a tax on your life and your energy and your well-being is it? Um, I don't think it's as bad as as a lot of people would expect. Uh, my my jujitsu coach still lives in Omaha, so I you know, and I still have my strength and conditioning program and my boxing coach at home, so. I don't really miss anything training wise. Uh, I guess the trade off would be it's just a pain in the ass to travel twice every weekend. Do you have that global entry thing where you can just waltz through the airport? <laughs> no, I don't actually. Dude, my wow, wife I'm got serious. it. It's a, it's a game changer. Is it? I need to yeah. do that. I need to just get it out of the way. Just set it up and get it done. All right, man. So let's talk about it here a little bit. I want to talk about John Jones specifically, but let's talk about the training out there in, in Colorado. Now, you're at Factory X, as I understand it, right? I am, with Mark Montoya. Yeah, tell me about Mark and your and yours relationship. How did it get started, and what keeps it together? Um, well, I've always had a, a connection with uh, Chris Camozzi, and Chris was one of Mark's first fighters as far as MMA goes. And, you know, a couple years ago, I, I was looking to uh, to kind of switch things up. I knew I needed a little bit more than I was getting, and... Uh, I've always heard about how great of a coach Mark was. So I came out, I checked it out for a week and, and Andrew Sanchez was our first fight together. And, and I really think that every, I think that not only in fighting, but in life in general, everything's about your connection with, with other people. And, and Mark, Mark and I's connection is, is solid. It, it, I think he just understands me better than anyone else does. And, and it, it's working out really good for me. What is it that he understands about you, your strengths and your weaknesses and how to raise one and combat the other? Like, when you say that, what do you mean exactly? Uh, you know, he doesn't treat every fighter the same. You know, as he gets to know you, he gets to know what works best for you. Like, I mean, as far as motivation goes, what, you know, what he says to you in certain moments, you know, we've gotten so tight and we've spent so much time together that Mark can look at me during training uh, and almost see exactly what I'm thinking. And, and he'll stop the session and we'll have a conversation about whatever's going on in my head. Um, it's almost like we see the same things. I don't, I don't know. It's really strange, but, but it really, it's really working out. All right. Um, you know, it's interesting when you get to a huge spot like this, I would imagine the teammates play a pretty critical role, not merely in getting you ready, but I wonder, do they say things like, Oh man, this is the big one. This is it. How are they treating your opportunity? day in day out when you're with them what are they like about it yeah it's kind of split down the middle uh kind of the 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 older guys you know that are i wouldn't say old but the older ones that are around my age uh you know it, it, it's it's almost as like we all got this opportunity you know and, and we're getting ready for it together and and it's really just we've all put our head down and, and, and just grinded towards this but I can definitely tell that the younger guys uh, have a little bit, you know, the up and comers, the guys are trying to get into the UFC or, or the guys that have just got there. Um, they're just super stoked. You know, it, it's something that they don't really know. They're not that far in their career yet to, to where they're pushing towards title fights or, or whatever. So those guys are just super amped, you know, and they're really excited and they want to know what it's like. And, and, you know, it's kind of along, along those lines, but kind of the older grizzled veterans, you know, we kind of know what to expect. And it's more just, uh, I don't know. It's just, we're just grinding, you know, cause they want to be, they want to get me as ready as, as anybody. 
So it sounds like it's helpful, um, but you basically, you know, not. I mean, this is your first UFC title shot, but not essentially your first rodeo. You've had many, many fights, right? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. So the 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 guys that are closer to where I'm at in my career kind of kind of know what's going on and and what everything looks like, and the younger guys are just super pumped. How different has this camp been from, let's say, previous camps at light heavyweight? Um. As far as the train, I mean, it's it's similar, but it definitely has its differences. Everything is much more, it's much more, uh, I would say, it's specifically focused around jump, right? So most of my other camps, it's really, you know, we kind of look at what my opponents do well, where they may have some holes. And, and really, I just try to get better everywhere, generally. Uh, we didn't really focus too hard on any specific things. John Jones is a different beast. You, th- there's a lot of things that you need to focus on specifically. So, you know, the the the, tra- the training is a lot more specific uh, on certain things. And then, you know, we really kind of dove in head first and, into really making sure that my conditioning is taken care of. You know, it, we, we kind of you know went out to California and did a bunch of testing uh, before the fight was even announced, kind of expecting that this was going to happen. And kind of my entire training camp has kind of really been based around my heart rate and, and really targeting times and, and specific places that I need my heart rate and ranges. So I, I think that that's probably been the biggest change is just really making sure that cardio wise that, that I'll be fine. Let's talk about your opponent, John Jones, if we can here, you know, one of the things that really frustrates me is I don't know what to make of all the run-ins he's had with anti-doping authorities and various other authorities as well. Here's one thing I do know. I think if you look at the tape and I'm certainly no expert, but I don't think you have to be, you just have to call a ball and a strike. He has very, very high fight IQ. He makes really good decisions. He's a smart fighter. So in preparation for that, do you watch tape of his, I guess first you grew that assessment. And then second, do you watch tape of his more recent fights? Have you looked and examined it, how he competes? Uh, well, first, yeah, I absolutely agree with you as far as his fight IQ and his skill set goes. Um, but honestly, I haven't watched – my coaches have, have watched a ridiculous amount of John Jones film from the beginning all the way until recently. But uh, honestly, I've watched him fight Gustafson, and I, haven't, I watched it live, and I haven't watched it again. Um, I, I don't want to wrap myself up, and I don't want to get lost in, in – what John does, what he doesn't do, what I, you know, and then it, cause then in my head, I'm going to start rolling through all the stuff that I've seen. And then we're going to be in front of each other and I'm going to be expecting certain things. I'm going to be thinking, I see a tell and maybe I don't really see it. And maybe I'm making stuff up in my head. I don't even want to get wrapped up into that. So my coaches watch it. Mark watches it specifically. And, and then we just work on the, the game plan that he comes up with. So I, honestly, I really, ha- I haven't watched, a, other than watching him fight Gustafson live, I haven't watched John fight in, in a handful of months. So then how does one strategically prepare for this, right? I mean, is it the idea that you can't look at his old fights and discern where everyone else went wrong? Like, how do you know what the right path is strategically without, or I, I know your coaches are viewing it, but I'm asking you for your own, let's say, uh, comfort at night. How do you know you have the right strategic apo- approach given all those other contexts? You know, it sounds really, really goddamn silly, but I just believe in Mark. So if he says that this is going to happen or this is not going to happen or, you know, this whatever technique is going to be open and here's how I want you to counter it, then I just, that's all I think about. I just think about what Mark has put in front of me. Uh, and, and and then I just, that's what I focus on. You know, I, I have my, I have training partners that, that we, we mirror him as much as we can. Uh, and, and then we just train it over and over and over and over. And, and I just hope that when I see it, uh, it'll, it'll be familiar. Hmm. Um, all right. So let's talk about this. You have been one of the guys who has typically <laughs> been really good. No, no, it's interesting. I don't, some people <laughs> interpret my hum as, uh, condescending, but it's not that at all. It is, um, I have to think about that more. It's interesting. I hadn't considered things in certain ways. I don't know anyone in my life <laughs> who I have that much trust in other than my wife, but she doesn't have that kind of advice for like my own profession. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't have that person in my life that you do. Does that make sense? So when I hear a fighter say they have such well, deep faith, it's, uh, I, I don't know what it's that's not like. Any it's, it's not any different than, than any of the other fights that I've had with Mark. Uh, 
when I was younger in my career, I, I really put a lot of time into obsessing over watching film. And then I would get in there and it would just freeze me because now I'm looking for something that hasn't happened yet. And as I've gotten further along in my career, and I, I figured out that if I just trust in Mark to, to put those things in front of me when I need to see them, when John does it, then it'll then, then I'll know exactly what he's talking about. And it, it kind of sounds like it's a little bit of a game and it kind of is to me, you know, like, you know, in the, in the Hector fight, he said over and over and over that he was going to kill me with leg kicks, you know, that he was going to just rip the leg kicks over and over and over. And instead of watching Hector do it, I just, I just waited for it. And, and they came and because I didn't buy into what Mark was saying, I kind of didn't even consider it was going to happen. So that was kind of my learning experience. Uh, that I just need to trust what he says. All right, fair enough. Uh, you normally like talking to the media. Has it been a little bit different this time? I mean, certainly you're gracious with your time. That's not what I mean. What I'm suggesting is when you were on that rise up this past year, all the questions were a lot about like, hey, how's it going? This is great. How awesome. And now it feels like the questions, the tenor, as I look at my media brethren, they've switched a little bit, right, because of the nature of the matchup and because there is this, let's be honest about it, there's a lingering uh, doubt uh, about some of your upside here. Uh, has that been annoying as a change? No, no, no. I, 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 I always enjoy talking to the media, but you're, you're, you're very right that it, instead of the, Hey, great win. What are you looking to do next? Or, or what's your plan in this fight or, or whatever? It's more, all right. So everyone thinks that he's going to kick your ass. How does that make you feel? <laughs> that's kind of the, the rhetoric that's kind of going along. Uh, but I, I don't mind it all, man. I, I, and I expected this, you know, I, I expected when I started talking about fighting John, when I was getting ready to fight Shogun, I knew that the, the topic of the conversations were going to be much different and that the, the questions were going to be formulated a little bit differently. Uh, if I had to ask you what this fight is about, what would you say? I mean, a belt, more money, status, respect, legacy, identity, self-actualization. What, what, like, why are you, like, what is this fight about? It's about the world title. Uh, it, it, I wouldn't be, in, I, I feel like I'd be preparing and, and I feel exactly the same way if it was Gustafson or if it was Cormier or, or whoever. It, it's, it's not about John Jones. And, and I think that that's what's kind of thrown everybody off is I'm not attacking John Jones. I'm not attacking who he is as a person. I'm not even talking about the things that he's done wrong because I don't care. I, I really don't. I, it, this is about the the gold belt that he has around his waist, and that's it. I, that's all I care about. Yeah, interesting. I saw you had a run in on social media with Colby Covington. He was out there. Yeah. He's out there uh, poking the bear as he normally does, and you didn't uh, appreciate that. I'm wondering why you even responded at all, and then what was the situation that you referenced there, where he, you had uh, I think suggested that you guys had a face to face meeting and. He, d he did not respond favorably to it. What, what was that all about? Well, the only reason I said anything in that situation to Colby is because, I mean, a month ago when Colby was going off about his losing his own title shot, he threw me under the bus as almost, almost to defend himself for needing one. Like, well, Anthony Smith got one and he's a piece of shit. So why can't I get one? And I, I just, it's the same with the Luke Rockwell thing. Like I just hate people that are, that are just assholes for no reason. Like I, again, I don't have any issue with Colby and I've never had a, I've never had any issue with Colby. The, the Chicago thing that I was talking about was when Colby started really trash talking everybody that wasn't in his lane. Uh, it kind of changed how he has to act around people because he doesn't even remember who he's defended and, and who he's, up, who he's upset. So he can't do the things that regular fighters do like train in the host hotel with everyone else. So my manager owns a gym in Chicago. So when we were both there fighting on that card, I just trained at my manager's gym because it's more comfortable there. Uh, typically, I would stay in the host hotel with everyone else. And then, and it, but it's, and it's not anywhere close to where the hotel was. It, it was a, a, a significant jaw away. So I'm there working out, and then Colby comes in because he has to find somewhere as far away from UFC fighters as he can get to train not knowing that, you know, it's owned by one of the managers of some of the guys in the UFC. And then he gets there and, and he's the most skittish person I've ever seen. He looks like a, a scared cat when he's not around all the cameras because he's, and I understand what he's doing. I get it, but he, he can't, he's put himself in a position where he can't just be a normal person in normal places anymore because he's pissed everybody off. 
So he has to hide off in the corner of the gym the whole time and keep looking over his shoulder because he doesn't know who wants to come in and slap him in the back of the head. And that's that's how he is away from the cameras and everyone else. So that and that's my only issue is that he's just attacking people that's not in his way. And, you know, it'd be like me, you know, attacking 55ers. Like, what's the point of that? You know, I don't understand how that puts you forward in, in, in your career anymore. How much of this fight, and it doesn't sound like there's much, but maybe you can maybe you can tell me differently. You mentioned it was about the world title. Okay, fine, I believe that. Is there any impulse you have to suppress about this creeping either idea or emotion in your body that, oh, you know what, yes, it's about the world title, but wouldn't it be sweet to stick it to the haters? Is there is there any part of you that has to wrestle with that? Yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot. It, uh, again, back to Mark, he tells me all the time that I need to worry about impressing myself and no one else. And, and that's the piece that I'm going to struggle with a little bit. Uh, I, I would venture to guess it's going to be really hard for me to stay humble talking to Joe Rogan afterwards because the, the outpour of hatred has been incredible. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily bother me too much, but it is a little bit shocking, like how so many people can care so much one way or the other, it just blows my mind. But there, there is a little bit of the, you know, sticking into the haters uh, feeling there for sure. On some level, though, there has to be a little bit comforting. It's like, oh, this is what people talked about when they said, you know, more money, more problems. This, this is the, this is exactly what they meant, isn't it? For sure, for sure. When it first happened, I was, it was a little bit shocking when it first started. But I, I, honestly, at this point, I've kind of gotten used to it, and. And as the fight gets closer and closer, I, I do see that it's changing a little bit. Uh, you know, I don't see as many John Jones is going to beat your ass, you pussy comments as much anymore. I, I see a lot of guys hoping. I don't see a whole lot of believers, but I see a lot of, a lot of people that really, really hope. You know what? I have a theory about that. You want to hear it? Yeah. I mean, I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> uh, my theory on that is the the posture you have taken, which is this is about me and my opportunity and my dream and this challenge. I don't care about John's picograms. I don't care about this. I don't care about that. I, I am solely focused on this, and I'm going to be a professional about it. I think that has disarmed a lot of people who are otherwise ready to pull the knives out. Some people will pull the knives out no matter what. There's nothing you can do about that. But the other people who were kind of on the fence are like, you know what? All right. How can I really hate on that approach? That That's my theory. You know, I, I, I was listening to uh, Joe Rogan's uh, fight companion uh, after it was all over for the, the event last night. And uh, I kind of got that same vibe from Brendan Schaub. When this first, when this fight was first announced, Brendan Schaub was just all over me. Like, what the hell is this guy doing here? Like, this is not smart, you know, this kind of throw me under the bus, you know? And then, you know, on the fight campaign, his kind of attitude has changed a little bit. Like, you know, I really like that guy. You know, I don't know if he really is a believer, but uh, it's definitely changed. And that's kind of overall as a broad spectrum, that's kind of how, it, how it's been. And, and I understand it. Uh, and, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to, to, to winning and changing everybody's minds, that's for sure. Or right, before I let you go, last question about this. Not every athlete's the same in this one, so I, I wonder what your uh, method is. A, do you do any visualization? And that can be any number of things. Scenarios, pre-fights, what a face-off's going to be like, what a weigh-in's going to be like, all that stuff, including the fight itself. And then if you do visualizations, do you allow yourself to visualize what it's like post-fight? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do a lot of visualization. It, most times it's... Uh, it's not like I know a lot of guys visualize a lot at night and and kind of before they go to sleep they think about what they want to do and I don't I try not to do that I try to keep my my visualization of of the fight I try to keep it kind of reined in because if not it can kind of consume you if you're just constantly going over the fight and how you think it's going to go in your head uh, so I try to make sure that I shut it off but uh, I would say mine is also a little bit different because I don't always visualize myself in the best positions. You know, I, I try to make sure that I, I kind of think of the worst case scenario and then visualize myself working out of it. Post fight is a little bit different. Uh, cause I don't really know, you know, I've, I've never won a world title before, so I don't know what that's going to look like. Um, I've thought about that moment in the, in the octagon a lot afterwards, you know, kind of when the crowd's going crazy and, and 
that just look of stupor on everyone's faces trying to figure out what the hell just happened. Uh, and, and that's kind of as far as I can get because I don't know what the rest looks like, but mm. that's kind of how it goes for me. Actually, I lied. Last one. This is my last one, I promise, because I know you got to get stuff to do. Um, You're fine. There was, over the weekend, before yesterday's fights, Cain Velasquez was asked by TMZ. And by the way, TMZ, I, if you haven't heard the audio, they just stick a camera in his face, and they're like, could you beat John Jones? And he's like, uh, I have groceries. I'm going to my car. Sure, I can. You know, it was one of those things. Anyway, John right. responded and was like, uh, you know, my heavyweight days are inevitable. Well, now Cain loses. Do you, do you make anything out of this? Maybe you could say, well, John had his sights on this one, and and now that's gone up in smoke. Does any of that whole thing matter to you at all? No, not at all. I, I learned really quickly not to put too much weight in anything John says. Uh, you know, I, when, I, when I was at the presser, uh, I figured out that anything that John says is very calculated. It, it's, he doesn't just say anything for no reason. He has a reason behind everything that he says, even his subtle, you know, his, his passive aggressiveness at the press conference, just little stuff like that, that I, that I notice and that I'm just not going to put any time into. Uh, I'm not, I'm not anyone else that he's fought. I'm not going to play his stupid mind games. And I, I think that this is just another one of those, you know, it's just a distraction. All right. Well, there you have it. Um, I would be there at the fights, but my wife's going to have a kid, so I can't. But I wish you nothing but the best of luck. You don't need it, but I just say it anyway. Thank you so much for your time, Anthony Smith. Really appreciate it. Can't wait to see what you have in store for us on March 2nd. Awesome, man. Thanks a lot.